Right, well, here we are. I've been requested by many of you by this point to make another video, and I frankly had uh, no idea what the subject would be. I've tried over the course of the past few months to make additional videos, but never been exactly happy with the way it turned out and figured I didn't want to give you guys a piece of trash. Well, some of you have um, said also that uh, you prefer the non-educational content, the stuff associated which is basically my view of the world. And just remember that I'm not God. I'm not somehow the infallible source of all, and don't take what I say too seriously, because it is, in the end, my opinion, which I try to, at least to the best of my ability, justify with facts. After having moved to the United States and, attending a, and attended a coding boot camp, disconcerting to me the nature of the various narratives that I hear coming from very young people as well as from let's say the um, intellectual elite it winds up becoming a question of what kind of a worldview we want to be propagating. And I think it ultimately starts with the question, is life worth living or not? Is life worth living or not? And, well, people have different answers this particular question. Some people will flat out say no. And the appropriate response then is, well, why haven't you done something about it? You know, there is something about our basic survival instinct that kicks in, and so at least at some very deep level, we are forced to acknowledge that life is, is worth living. So, a very small proportion of people actually commit suicide. But then amongst those who don't commit suicide, there are other questions that need answering. Uh, one of which is, okay, why am I hanging around? Because the fact that life is difficult is, well, obvious. No matter how good things are, they can always be better. And no matter how good things are, things will always go wrong. In fact, I don't know of anyone in existence that's led such a sheltered life that they're completely content. I don't know that being able to actually be happy is part of the current human condition. So we're going to constantly be striving for something more. Right? Or pretending to be happy with what we have. And, you know, even coming close to contentment seems to be a pretty gargantuan task. And while we're on the subject of contentment, well, that brings up another question entirely, and that is, well, should we be content? Or should we be striving? As if striving is the opposite of contentment. But I would say that contentment and complacency are two different things. Because if we look at contentment from a holistic perspective, if we look at it from the perspective of, okay, I have what I have, and I can either have a good attitude about it or a bad attitude about it, generally, 
part of the human condition is being able to impose one's will on the world. And so, first off, if we assess whether or not we're actually willing the right things to begin with, um, but let's just, let's just go past that point. Let's, let's say that, okay, we have a, a will, and we have some means of, 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 of either communicating that will or achieving that will or doing something of that nature. Okay, so now we're in the process of just trying to assess the situation and say, okay, am I really that ill-equipped? Am I really that ill-equipped to make things better? Am I really that ill-equipped? And the answer in some circumstances is yes. You know, it's, uh, there is the uh, mythological creature of the Hydra. And that's the one where you chop off one head of the reptilian creature and three more emerge, right? So no matter what it is that you're doing, you constantly wind up making more problems for yourself. And that was something that at least the ancients acknowledged were part of human existence, but we seem to kind of cling on to the idea that somehow we can do something better. But I actually think that we're much more likely to be happy if we concede the point that this life is never going to be perfect. And we've gone about as far into the subject as I can while still maintaining a secular position. Right? If we then go into the Lutheran position, which is the one that I hold, uh, there are other concessions that need to be made. Uh, and one of them is that, uh, well, in the, in the creed we say we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Right? So we believe that this life isn't all there is. And we have our hope in things to come. And the way we conduct ourselves in this world then is by loving our neighbor. That's basically the, the answer. Okay, so what should you do with your time? Well, love your neighbor. And that means that making things go well is more of an indirect consequence of, maybe even a direct consequence, but it's, it's, it's more a side effect of loving your neighbor than it is an actual end in and of itself. So if we look at things going well or things going badly as predominantly side effects as opposed to the actual problem, or benefit, um, that allows us a completely different perspective than what um, most secular uh, worldviews would have us would have us take, would have us understand. So, but that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come, and still, for some reason, people continue to do so even now. Even now, more than a century after Nietzsche made the famous declaration that God is dead. Right, and it's somehow that that uh, the theological and philosophical underpinnings of the entirety of Western civilization was in some way predicated upon a Judeo-Christian set of values in addition to uh, some Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy. An interesting amalgam, to be sure. It's also quite interesting as to how a Platonism has had an influence on, shall we say, popular and semi-popular conceptions of religion. But anyhow, going back to the point of... Um, 
of, of, of Western civilization and of God being dead and of people believing in God. And by God being dead, of course, I mean not whether or not God is actually alive, but uh, that it is, shall we say, no longer a tenet of modernity that God exists. Well, Lutherans have had an answer to that issue a long time ago because the inevitable question is how could you be so stupid as to believe there is a God when there are completely naturalistic explanations for everything that's going on around us and indeed why would you be so stupid as to believe that there's a God when there's all this evil right? and that's a, that's, a, that's a legitimate question it's one that theologians have struggled with for thousands of years And there isn't an easy answer, but there is at least some semblance of an answer that says, well, look, we can't, I can't go and force you to believe in you thinking that, you, that you're going to just, for some reason, waste your time in calling me an idiot for saying that I believe something is it's just kind of silly. Uh, Luther's explanation uh, of the third article of the Apostles' Creed begins, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. Right? And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's the job of the Holy Spirit to do that. Um, which sounds an awful lot like Calvinist double predestination, except it's not. It's a mystery and it's one that I don't know if you'll ever have an adequate explanation for it if you don't believe. And then if you do believe, it's going to be very difficult to dissuade you. Regardless, it's just one of those kinds of things. Anyhow, going back to the point of life not being all that it can, Lutherans, or at least those that believe the general corpus of what Lutherans have believed for the past 502 years or so, and what's been taught by the Catholic Church way prior to then, believe that um, that's, that's just part of the package deal. Suffering is just part of the package deal. Difficulty is just part of the package that we get. And that loving God and loving our neighbor is well, A, before sin came in the world, the only way to do things, and B, even now that sin is in the world and ruining things, Still the best way to conduct ourselves. Now, from a psychological perspective, that's also pretty useful because then you wind up getting your focus off of yourself and you find it much more difficult to throw a pity party. But the point is that even if it weren't a guarantee to make things better, which by the way it's not, it does at minimum, I would say, increase the good odds and decrease the bad odds. Loving your neighbor is um, the right thing to do and should be done just because it is the right thing. That would be a, you know, the position that one would take if we're, if we're talking about, say, virtue ethics. Now, that's being said, um, there's also a lot on the freedom of a Christian, which is that... Um, Lots of, lots of Christians go looking for signs as to how, what do I do here, what do I do there, and they want to be able to essentially abdicate responsibility for their life by saying, hey, I'm going to imagine all these signs and things, or I'm going to actually look for them and find some way of post hoc contriving some idea that kind of justifies my fifis and blah, blah, blah in terms of what it is I should be doing which I think is absolute hogwash, right? We actually have a considerable amount of freedom to decide how we're going to love our neighbor. And sometimes it might work better than other times, but loving one's neighbor is categorically better than not loving one's neighbor. It's 
So, going back to what I see a lot of the problems stemming from its abject selfishness, or a focus on one's rights more so than one's duties. Now, duty is an ugly word nowadays because, oh, I shouldn't be beholden to anybody. I should be able to just do whatever I want. Well, life has never been that way. Life has never been that way. You should be able to do what you want, certainly. But don't think there's not a price to be paid. Don't think there's not a price to be paid. And now you wind up having a bunch of people in a semi-rational, hedonistic fashion pursuing what they think is going to make them happy. And because what they're doing is so devoid of any meaning whatsoever, they're just miserable. And you're just chasing after trinkets or experiences or whatever. And if that's the end of your life, well then you're never going to be happy because there's always something more to be had. That of course is something else that Christians and Stoics have been now saying for thousands of years. But it's a temptation that everybody has in every generation, and so it's one of these things that needs to be returned to. The difficulty nowadays is that because we are in, shall we say, the late stages of modernism or the stage of postmodernism, um, nobody or very few people that are that have a platform actually dare say anything to this effect. Now there are people like Jordan Peterson who, you know, I think gets a lot of things right and gets a whole lot of things wrong, um, but he's made an attempt to say something along these lines. At least in terms of taking responsibility. Um, but, um, but by and large, um, the people with the biggest microphone are the ones who are the biggest whiners. You know. Now, people, it's 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 also very interesting because it kind of it showed itself when I wound up getting a job in IT. Right? I wound up getting a job in IT working for um Fortune 500 company. Uh, got, got, got a DevOps job. And it was interesting when I, when I was interviewing because one of the concerns was that I would quickly leave for greener pastures because the job would be boring. Okay? As so if somehow I have a right to interesting work. And the fact of the matter is whether something is boring or not is largely contingent upon one's attitude more so than the actual nature of the job. A siren somewhere, but uh, I guess it's not over here, so I don't have to pull over. So, because this is largely contingent upon one's attitude, <clears throat> it is for me, anyhow, kind of silly. Very, very silly. Because it seems that um, people actually like being miserable. Or at least they like having a pity party thrown. So that they can abdicate responsibility even further. And then, as Nietzsche so predicted slash demonstrated slash spoke of prior to it actually happening the answers were largely I 
lost track of what I was saying. Someone got pulled over. The answers have been this grim, horrible, nihilistic viewpoint that life is just flat out not worth living, or at least, you know, kind of a continuation of what 14-year-old emo boys and girls uh, believe only extended into one's 40s and 50s. Or, which is very, very, very closely linked, this desire to have to keep responsibility and to this desire to abdicate responsibility and to uh, give it to the government. To say, okay, let's just let the size of the government increase, let the responsibility of the government increase, and as long as I get my bread at circuses, I'm going to be happy. Which, of course, leads to people voting for people who essentially say I'm going to take money from people who don't vote for me and give them to people who do. Right? And so you wind up getting the opportunists who smell an easy buck or an easy trip to power by capitalizing upon people being shitheads. Well, and things are so good nowadays. Certainly not perfect, but but if we have any kind of perspective whatsoever, we understand that it's better than at any given point in history. Worldwide, abject poverty is an all-time low. Now granted, due to the great capacity for wealth building nowadays, wealth inequality is also at an all-time high if you look at the lowest to the highest. And it's only ever going to increase as productivity increases. So, well, I guess that's just kind of a natural consequence of, of doing things. I mean, Pareto's gone in seeing that distribution occur. And the means that we choose for the distribution is largely, well, it merely selects who's at the top, not that there will be people at the top or at, whether there will be people at the top or at the bottom. And it's also interesting that the biggest of the whiners tend to be the people that are young bottom because they are young. They're at the bottom because they haven't had a chance to go and amass for themselves wealth and power and influence and all these other good things. Then if you go and you think about the people that are actually at the bottom, the people that are perpetually at the bottom, the people that are actually hurting and have a very difficult time getting out, it's not like It's not like they're altogether too easy answers for them. I mean, the answer, the answer nowadays is always redistribute, redistribute, redistribute. But that doesn't even make people happy, because if you know that you don't deserve what you're getting. Which, no matter how many times you say, I deserve this, you know if you work for something or when you have it. If you never had the chance to experience the pride of a job well done, the sense of accomplishment that it gives, the fact that if you get something good on account of it, that actually is coming to you. And you've never gotten a chance to experience that positive feedback loop. Well, I think that something should be done in order to let you have that experience, but I definitely don't think that uh, 
that the answer is to vote for redistributionist policies perpetuated by those who capitalize on a hatred of the rich rather than a love for the poor. And then if we understand that poverty in the United States isn't even anything like poverty in the United States was 70 years ago. Not even middle class people were just starting to get refrigerators. Okay, if middle class people were just starting to get refrigerators 70 years ago, think about that. How many poor people in the United States do you know that don't have a refrigerator? How many poor people in the United States do you know that do have a TV, probably bigger than the one I own? Many. But if they're sitting in front of that TV, constantly consuming crap. You know, sitcoms aren't real, guys. Uh, these cherry-picked streams of reality trademark are not real. You know, seeing people's Facebook feeds and people's Twitters and Instagrams and all the crap that people decide they're actually going to share is not an accurate snapshot of reality and if, if we're comparing our ordinary boring lives with the highlight reel of others and imaginary things then we're not going to be happy Christianity. It's not maybe the answer you want. Because our hope isn't in this world, or at least isn't in this life, as it is. But I would say that it's your answer. I mean, every morning. Well, I'll, I'll flat out tell you what I say every morning and evening. And in the morning, it's. Well, it's. Do I want to just tell you the prayer, or do I want to tell you the whole thing? We'll start out with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. So judgment day is, 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 is actually a comfort. I believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Christian Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And then, after declaring what it is that you believe, which is actually our way of worshiping God, or a way of worshiping God, saying, okay, if all you want us to do is believe, well, I believe you pray because he says well this is how you should pray so you pray the father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven you see all of this thy stuff it's not my will be done on earth etc there is a prayer the, the next petition is give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And um, 
then in the morning, it's Luther's morning prayer, which is, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, and you've kept me this night from all harm and danger. So there is no guarantee you get up in the morning. It really isn't. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Right? Sin is the bad thing to be avoided. Evil is the bad thing to be avoided. of 
being somehow intellectually superior to our predecessors. Keep us from believing in God. And I would say that if you took us and put us in some situation a thousand years back, we would be hard pressed to do any better than the people that were there even with the knowledge that we have. So, on this, the day after Thanksgiving, I would say that, you know, for those that aren't believers in God, that, you know, still practicing gratitude isn't a bad thing to do. And specifically for those who do believe in God, that practicing gratitude isn't even a bad thing to do, but for what? Because if you really believe what the Bible says, that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is currently reigning, that that means that we are operating on faith, not on sight. So even all the evil things that we see, even all the different things that we struggle with, are somehow being used for good. And that definitely requires a leap of faith. Because there are so many things that aren't good in our eyes. And because we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, we don't actually we believe that we're not going to know how all this works out until judgment day until everything happens, until everything is all completely finished and brought to completion. But now we see what is through a glass dimly, but then face to face. So what I'm saying here and suggesting is actually not that easy. In fact, I would say this human from, from, from a, a, a strictly humanist perspective, it's crazy. But it's something that's certainly been on my mind. and It's been the cause for a bit of consternation. And I figure that, especially as the uh, political climate continues to heat up, in anticipation of the 2020 elections that we might be able to bring our focus to the things that actually matter. And as Christians, that would mean that yes, we can have our focus on loving our neighbor, but even more so have our focus be on understanding that we're forgiven and that we don't have to drag around baggage associated with the past or worry associated with the future to cause us consternation, but that we are free to be able to love our neighbor in whatever way seems best to us. enough because the responsibility for the outcome is not ours. So that's my Thanksgiving ruminations. And at least 
for now. That's all I've got to say. You know, it's somewhat disjointed and somewhat perhaps a bit difficult to follow. But I hope that it can be useful for you nevertheless. Talk to you later.